hey there, get your red hots as they used to holler at Yankee Stadium selling hot dogs that obviously had a lot of uh, artificial dye in them if they were red and they were hot, but they were also artificially red. Um, uh, we're here today to launch Art Isn't Fair, we being the co-editors, me, Sally Stein, and Ina Steiner. Uh, the launch of uh, the new Alan Sekula collection, Art Isn't Fair, Further Essays on the Traffic in Photographs and Related Media. Why this title? Well, uh, we actually are going to show you the film from which it's drawn. It's the last work that Alan made in 2012. He died of terminal cancer in 2013. And Ina now is going to give you a little background on this film before we screen it. Ina, take it away. Yeah, thank you, Sally. In 2012, Sikula was asked to contribute to a collection of short films to commemorate Jean-Jacques Rousseau's 300 um, 300th anniversary. So he drew upon old footage he shot at Art Basel Miami Beach in 2004, thinking specifically about Rousseau's discourse on the origin of inequality. And here's an excerpt from an email Sikula wrote when pitching his idea for this short film. I quote, it will be a short montage of footage I shot of an event hosted by the jewelry company Bulgari at the 2004 Miami Basel Art Fair. The, when the event took the form of an exquisite corpse performed by a panel of famous artists for an audience of wealthy collectors and other practitioners and aficionados. But here, please see for yourself, art isn't fair, five minutes and 16 second film. If I were making a film based on the book of Genesis, I would cast the philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau as Adam and the artist John Baldessari as God. Adam would be a firm believer in the political equality of all the people who had yet to exist. He would look warily at the shining apple, the only hint of luxury in paradise. Baldessari would play God as a joker, looking down at the first human affairs from a great height. Baldessari is fond of saying that for an artist, going to an art fair is like seeing your parents having sex. For me, this is especially funny, since he was my first art teacher and the first person to tell me I could be an artist. goes there. I thought now we should start a new dating system for art, you know, like, uh, like, you know, before Christ and after Christ, like before money and after money. The primal scene. I'm still looking for someone to play Eve. The idea of, of art as something 
to be dealt with in real time, but the question of, of the timing of art is something that tends to be suppressed. So it's kind of like one of these evil quasi-philosophical kind of questions, which seems to undermine the historical... I've still got 10 seconds of Jenny's time here, so I haven't even started yet. Turn to this box now, and we don't really know what what kind of questions are in here. It's just that the rules change a little bit. If you remember, when you remember, the when is the true when, you know, whenever the work pops up into your mind, and the where is in your mind, you reconstruct the work, and that's the action of making the work. Why are some artists celebrities? <laughs> <laughs> it's about uh, wanting to love. And if anybody really follows art and focuses on it, it will take you past wanting to be loved to loving. Okay, oops, we're losing time. And Trisha. I hope you enjoyed it at, at least a fraction of how much I like it. Um, I think it's, if one has to have a final piece, it's a great finale, um, for me at least. Um, and uh, I hope you get the pun of art shouldn't be an art fair and also art, uh, as Rousseau early talked about, um, it should not be part of the system of inequality. Um, We took that title for the entire collection and uh, for two reasons. One, I just thought it was an attention grabber, uh, especially in the art world. And um, secondly, because I actually, while we have a table of contents that shows a whole mix of materials, I think one of the threads through it is Alan's interest, not just in politics for which he's well known as a naysaying dissident, but also for his interest in art, but in art that might speak to issues of inequality. Uh, next. I think there's someone outside who's using power tools. Sorry about this. Um, I can't hear it, so it's fine. Most, okay. Uh, most of the materials uh, are from after 1983 because that's when, maybe we should move our, can you see the little, book thing because I yes, can't see it right now. I can. Okay. Um, because uh, 83 is the last, uh, the date of the last essay in Alan's first collection from 84, Photography Against the Grain, initially published um, under the auspices of editor Benjamin Puklo uh, and others at Nova Scotia College of Art and Design, that's kind of uh, whatever, um, in 1984 and reprinted in 2016 by Mac Books. Um, after Alan's death in 2013, we found in the archive and really began to appreciate an earlier essay than any published uh, in 1984 from his first years as a student at UC San Diego. This from 1971, a short autobiography. Why is this not working there? Uh, as you can see here, uh, 
he's writing in the first person, which is something for aerospace folk tales two years later, he drops for a more Brechtian third person impersonal. Um, but here it's housewife employed and aerospace engineer unemployed, my mother and my father, a bit unused to me behind the camera. It's Saturday, both are dressed for work. My father's about to go mail out a batch of resumes as at this time, following a contraction in the aerospace industry as the war in Vietnam is starting to wind down, he is constantly looking for work. Uh, I initially thought, oh, this is the same picture uh, that he used in aerospace folk tales, the more Brechtian folk tale that he wrote. Um, but Ina pointed out, no, it's not the same. It's another exposure. Um, and so we show it here so that you get the comparison. Next. In a short autobiography, and we're only showing you four panels altogether, uh, he really talks about uh, his decision as a university student to finally decide he's going to be an art major. He had enrolled with a plan to be a science major, and but ultimately found art more compelling at this. At, but art also concerned him already. He speaks here about the danger of becoming a loser instead of one of the few winners. So he's already thinking about inequality in the art world and more because he's taking many humanities courses on political theory, philosophy, um, including one with Marcuse. He here contrasts the somewhat insular art world um, with its formalism with Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth. So it is once again juggling oppositions and trying to figure out, is there some kind of synthesis, a synthesis between winners and losers, between formalist art and a discourse that really addresses um, inequality in its extreme forms in the global world. Oops. The last panel from this it is number 10, Godard and Mao in San Diego. Ultimately, here he speaks about the plan to buy a camera from his savings from work uh, to make a film at the Republican National Convention being planned for the summer of 1972 uh, to uh, uh, run the second uh, campaign for Nixon. Nixon's the one, um, for those of you who were around that long ago uh, to remember the slogan. Um, so he's talking about this. Ultimately, the convention was moved to Miami for a number of reasons, but they felt that Miami, it was easier to control crowds than in San Diego. So that never happened, but already film is coming up in 71 to think about different possibilities of ways of approaching the world and approaching social problems in the world. Uh, at the time, he did experiment at the university with a couple of videos, but ultimately he mainly worked in still photography and called his sequences uh, disassembled movies. I can't even see the top of this text. Ina, can you read this? Because I can't see it. Um, On the right, I'm showing you uh, some of the opening pages from Canadian Notes. I can't read the top of this, how it's on my screen. So maybe you can, can you? Uh, the text, all other texts in this collection date from later 1980s to 2012. And they range freely and widely between long historical essays, shorter critical pieces, essays on contemporary artists, photo pieces, a libretto for proposed opera, plus transcripts of narration and dialogue from two films this diversity attests to Sekula's refusal to be boxed in by the conventional discursive boundaries of art and politics. He experimented with and sometimes intercut multiple forms with tones also arranging and switching from terror to slapstick to advance his idea and ways of seeing both socioeconomic struggles in the contemporary world and the historical antecedents antecedents. And Throughout he, these explorations of topics and forms, he constantly considered the role of photography and art more generally in maintaining or contesting the prevailing norms of power and order. So on the right, I'm showing you uh, a bit of Canadian notes. Uh, and he's there interested, he was very influenced by Raymond Williams, uh, The Country and the City. And here, 
when uh, he is working on a piece about Canada's economics and Canada's major industry, which was the nickel, the mining of nickel off in Sudbury. Um, he shows us both the capital, Ontario, with the Bank of Canada and the Parliament building facing each other. And then he's here a wintry scene from uh, the outside of the Sudbury mine with the big nickel. And here I'm making a juxtaposition uh, to give you a sense of other kinds of threads. Uh, this is another from the notes on the left where Alan makes in the summer in Sudbury um, in this very sort of arid uh, scene, a self-portrait, silhouette self-portrait uh, of his shadow with the camera and the tripod. Uh, above, more of his studies of the Ericsson new atrium uh, addition to the Bank of Canada in which very slightly, I don't know if I can get my, yes, here, the cursor, you can see um, a monumental stone that, oops, nope, sorry, uh, that greets you if, once you go inside what Alan referred to as a weird bunch of refractive glass that's like um, a block of ice. Inside, we, he gives us a shot of the Yap stone, but also in the lobby of a man emerging from underneath the stone or maybe marble tiles um, to the guts of the building. Uh, one sometimes wonders why he accepted some invitations to work on minor projects such as the Melnitz book of manhole covers. Um, but um, it seemed to me when I started looking again at the photo of the Yap stone, it actually echoes with the shape of the manhole cover that we see over here. And um, it, as he writes in his essay, he speaks about how um, the making of manhole covers, usually out of cast iron, resembles something of the printing of coins. And he's very interested also in manhole covers, both mark and disguise the entries to the underworld where many people have to work such as we see also in the Bank of Canada. Um, a very important and long, the longest piece in the book is uh, photography between labor and capital that he was commissioned to write for a book on the archive of Leslie Shedden by the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design uh, under the auspices of both um, Bob Wilkie and uh, Benjamin H.D. Buclow. And uh, it, it's a very long essay. Uh, the earliest, the first part, um, reading an archive has been fairly widely reprinted, uh, but we wanted to give you the whole essay here because it's uh, out of print and not easily accessible. And Ina is going to read a few lines from this early portion. Yeah, and, and a lot lines which we decided uh, are, which we decided to um, print on the um, back of uh, the volume Art Isn't Fair. So um, the aim of this essay then is to try to understand something of the relationship between photographic culture and economic life. How does photography serve to, be, serve to leg legitimate and normalize existing power relationship? How does it serve as a voice of authority while simultaneously claiming to constitute a token of exchange between equal partners. What havens and temporary escapes from the realm of necessity are provided by photographic means? What resistances are encouraged and strengthened? How is historical and social memory preserved, transformed, restricted, and obliterated by photographs? What futures are promised? What futures are forgotten? Thanks. Uh, he's already asking these questions photographically in terms of issues of powers and how one might resist or counteract it. Um, in 1973, although it's one of the pieces that he only printed in 2012, and this is Red Squad, uh, at a San Diego demonstration, deciding not to do the obvious thing and photograph the crowds but to actually single out um, and also kind of partition between head and body, um, the various members of the 
surveillance police, the Red Squad, looking for Reds, trying to make IDs of all of them. This actually portends is a precursor to his work on the body and archive, which is the other major essay in the book. We're not gonna go over it here because it's been fairly widely reprinted and discussed, though we actually think our reprint puts the text with images in a more coherent conversation. Another uh, demonstration uh, body of work is the very widely circulated slide piece waiting for tear gas. But here we decided to print all 80, 81 or 80, 81. I never remember, Ina. Is it 80? 81, 81 um, of the images. Um, and Ina is going to read a portion of what is his statement of his working method here as an anti-photojournalist, uh, call it his manifesto here, uh, that he did in 2000 at the time of the demonstrations in Seattle against uh, the WTO. The working idea was to move with a flow of protest from dawn to 3 a.m. if need be, taking in the lulls, the waiting and the margins of events. The rule of thumb for this sort of anti-photojournalism, no flash, no telephoto zoom lens, no gas mask, no autofocus, no press pass, and no pressure to grab at all costs the one defining image of dramatic violence. Thank you. So here he declares himself an anti-photojournalist, but as an expression of his wide ranging, refusing to be boxed in um, position and sensibility when asked to uh, write something for uh, about Susan Mizellis's work um, on a portable national archive for stateless people, her work on the Kurdish diaspora. Um, he readily agrees, even though she's a very famous photojournalist. Uh, here he really stresses um, once again, as he also does in the body in the archive, which we're not spending time talking about today. He stresses uh, the efforts to use photography to find out more about people disappeared, people missing, to show people who have been assassinated or died in the diaspora, and also the work of archeologists and um, forensic anthropologists who are working at mass grave sites to try to identify other people who are lost. So he's actually very interested in Mizellus's work, uh, both as a journalist turned archivist um, of a nearly forgotten peoples. Next, uh, we're showing you just a bit of this uh, section on Black Tide Fragments for an Opera. And again, Ina is going to read, uh, it's much longer than what we show here, but uh, Ina will read um, a note that he wrote uh, to someone explaining what he had in mind in working on a, um, a weekend news uh, cultural supplement from La Vanguardia uh, about the issue of the terrible uh, spill on the Atlantic side of Spain in Galicia of the prestige oil tanker that had really fouled uh, a good portion of the coast, very important for fishing. Ina. Quote from Sikula, the whole point is to disturb expectations. Can a sketch for a libretto appear in a daily newspaper and include footnotes and an invitation to readers to submit their own lyrics, question mark. Thank you. RRJB in, uh, in the catalog, James Benning. Uh, uh, again, it's a little surprising that he would be invited um, to contribute to this, but he readily jumped at the opportunity. Uh, he wasn't really known as a film person, uh, but Benning was one of the um, documentary photo essay, film cinematic, cine essayists, excuse me, that he greatly admired. He starts by selecting a picture of the building of uh, Benning's cabin uh, based on a design that uh, of the cabin of Thoreau. Thoreau is a figure that he had 
actually read as a child. It was part of the library that his father bought of the great books, Walden. And, uh, uh, but he always admired both the observational skills that Thoreau demonstrated in his Walden Pond uh, monograph, and also Thoreau's principled uh, resistance to the state in his uh, civil disobedience and the essay he wrote advocating mid 19th century civil disobedience at a time when the government still supported slavery and slave states. Um, uh, but to me, it's a little funny that he would end up writing about James Benning because for those of you who might know or now want to know um, more of James Benning's films, they are extraordinary long takes uh, they're hyper observational and really requiring everyone to get into this observational mode. They are nearly silent films, except for the acute taping of ambient sound in these spaces. Um, and in many ways, this is just the opposite of Alan, who is constantly filling the audio with talk his talk, his narration, and also lots of dialogue, some of which is kind of crazy dialogue, but he thinks is part of the social audio environment that must be taken in as well. So it seems to me that while um, Alan never believed in reconciling across the political aisle, he was open to many different um, methods and techniques and forms adopted by other artists if it seemed to get us in a more resistant or um, counter mainstream mode as certainly is the case in James Benning. Such as uh, we're showing here with our a uh, fairly long transcript of a much longer film, which is his essay film, The Lottery of the Sea, which is a kind of transition work from fish story uh, that was both an exhibition and a book. And then he made this essay film, which goes on for three hours, I kid you not. And uh, then the somewhat shorter film he co-directed with Noel Birch, uh, which is The Forgotten Space uh, toward the end of his life. Um, we decided the transcript is very important, but we only found a partial transcript. And so we spent a lot of time actually listening again and again and filling in this transcript. Um, it's, there are great shots in this film, uh, not a single shot, but many shots that are montaged together, uh, including of the oil spill and the really it's kind of insanely futile attempted cleanup on the Galician coast of the prestige oil spill. Um, and there's lots of talk, including some really insane talk, like some guys talking about the size of one guy's dick, et cetera. Why he includes this is to remind us, yes, this is part of the social fabric too. Um, and then he brings it back uh, to Barcelona and to uh, strikes and demonstrations there against gentrification, uh, including the creation of an old port culture section into a new forum section with hotels and a convention space that initially is opened to a kind of uh, thinking about the polity, the body politic, but is ultimately meant as a business convention space. But in its first iteration, it even acknowledges the degree of protest that the building of this section, the gentrification of the part of the city has caused with this sign activist. Alan, of course, can't resist making a self-portrait there. Interrogating himself, am I really an activist or am I an artist or am I something, an intellectual or what else? Um, but rec sort of trying to juggle all those identities. Next. Finally, um, we end with another transcript, this time, of course, much shorter, um, of Art Isn't Fair, which we've already shown you. But uh, for those of you who didn't catch all the dialogue or want to see stills from some of the shoots, uh, we give this to you here. Including uh, a number of shots of the Ina pronounces it differently than I do, Bulgari, Bul Bulgari, um, uh, of their uh, clock here, which sometimes was actually messing up on one computer. Um, but the way 
uh, they of course get their name in a couple of times in the art fair. Um, uh, we also had to correct one thing we had discovered, uh, which is that Sam Keller, who is one of the art fair um, leaders, uh, trying to get a number of artists to join in a chorus here in this weird dialogue or conversation. Um, he, in the film, he actually identifies as Thomas Keller, and it is only Alan's Paris gallerist, Michel Rhin, who pointed out, that's not Thomas Keller, who's a famous California nouvelle chef, uh, famous for his The French Laundry, but that's Sam Keller. So we corrected it here, and we still plan to correct it in the video as well. Uh, finally, what we think is a novel innovation for MacBooks, the index, um, because there's lots of talk, both in transcripts and in long essays and also in short essays. Alan is an autodidact with an encyclopedic knowledge. He's constantly referring to other scholars, intellectuals and artists. Uh, so when Mac said, do you think we should hire a copy editor? I said, I really think we need an indexer. And he generously agreed. And this indexer did a great job and even helped us catch a couple of copy edit problems that we had not caught ourselves. So we thank Jane Friedman for the index and for overall design. We thank Jane Morgan Crowcroft Brown. And of course, we thank Michael Mack for supporting this long labor um, of over a year of preparing this book. Yes. Yes, we can't leave you without um, telling you a little bit about what is the source for this strange image on the cover. Uh, that we selected, and it's from another essay that is included here, An Eternal Aesthetics of Laborious Gestures, which is about photographies, as he also discusses in Photography Between Labor and Capital, and in Body and Archive, photography's role in both managing labor, sometimes aestheticizing it, such as we see here in The Family of Man, and but also, also from the very earliest photography of daguerre and daguerreotypes of concealing it. That requires that we look very hard in order to see not just the gentleman getting his boots shined, but the boot black, who in the earliest photography is rendered blur and requires us to look very hard in order to see it's not just one guy, it's two people in this that are captured in this picture, albeit the hardworking boot black working for Pence or Sue uh, is nearly obscured in the process as photography so often nearly obscures labor processes. But Sakula is constantly reminding us to look again, think again about where work actually is. From the beginning of his work as an artist and intellectual, to the end of his life. Finally, um, yes, we really are finally here. Uh, Mid-January 2021, we're going to, because this was really meant just as a trailer or teaser, uh, there will be an Artisan Fair roundtable with Makita Jata Best, David Campany, Chantal Pompriand, Stephanie Schwartz, and Willie, Billy Woodbury. And if you want to propose a question about this new Sekula book, order a copy to arrive, hopefully by the holidays, and then send your question by January 5 to Ina and me at ellens.sakula.studio at gmail.com. If we circulate your question for discussion by the five participants, and it really, we would like the, to keep this focused on the book, uh, we will make sure to credit you a source in the round table. Thanks. Um, we hope you, this intrigues you enough that you might want to look at a copy, get a copy. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you.